It's all beautifully quiet in here. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all this morning on this beautiful sunny day, and uh, thank you for being here. And if you're watching at home or wherever you may be, you're very welcome as well. Um, I've been really looking forward to today, not that I don't look forward to every Sunday, of course, but today is our first chance to have communion together. And we haven't done that in a long, long time. It seems like forever. Um, so I was really looking forward to, to doing that. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, it's all laid out, ready for later on. This will be the major part of what we do today. And if you happen to be at home watching this, and you'd like to partake in that as well, you could get some bread uh, and something to drink from your kitchen. And when it comes to communion time, you could share in that experience as well, if you'd like to do that. Um, so it's great to see you all. Just a few announcements before we kind of get into the, the meat of our service, really, is that um, I won't be here for the next four Sundays. <laughs> um, I regret every Sunday that I'll be missing. Um, no, I do. I'm not really. Well, I'm looking forward to it in one sense. But in another sense, I hate to leave this place, um, especially when good things are happening. Um, but we will be away for the next four Sundays, simply because we have to uh, um, quarantine for a couple of weeks whenever we get back. We'll be in England for a while, and then we've got to do that. Um, but our Wednesday broadcast that I do, if you tune into the Wednesday broadcast, I'm going to be doing them live on tour around the UK. And uh, so it'll be, ex Gwyn, it'll be exciting. Gwyn's one of my regulars. He keeps sending abuse all the time, uh, which I really appreciate. But we're going to be trying to do that um, as we go around. So you see, you'll be in my thoughts all the time. Um, during my absence, Andrew Gill, the Minister of Black Rock and Bray, will be looking at, after any pastoral needs, and his details will be on the website. So if you need a minister, Andrew Gill will be the one to, uh, to talk to. Terry, our wonderful Terry Price, will be taking our service for the next four weeks. So uh, that will be fantastic. It's always good to know you can leave this place in safe hands. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Good. I think that's all to mention. Yes, it is. Um, again, has anyone had a birthday in the last week or in the week to come? Has anyone had a birthday at all that we can give you a nice badge and pray for you? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? No. Well, that's good. I'll save my badges. Um, last week we had uh, Alan Foster, who I didn't realize had a very special birthday. He was 80 last week. On Wednesday, wasn't it, Alan? And uh, so I said, I would have realized it was 80 years old, I would have made more of a song and dance, because he loves my song and dance. But uh, it was good to celebrate. Anyone anyway, going to read some words from a psalm, Psalm 134, a very short psalm. As I read these, I think about a song that we used to sing, and, uh, and that is good. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. So let us draw near to this God who is the Lord of David, the Lord of us, he is the Lord of everyone, whether they realize it or not. He is the King. So let's join together to pray, shall we? Let's all pray. Father, it is so good to come to you. It's great to be together with those that we know and with those that we don't know so well, but it's good to be in this place. We think about those who used to minister in your sanctuary, right in the place where you presenced yourself. It's even greater today, Lord, to know that we are your temple, that you love to be with your people. There's no place you'd rather be. So, Lord, we come to you and we pray that you will speak to us. Father, we're simply flesh and blood. 
weak and frail, but you are our God. So, Father, we come to worship you. We come to hear your word. We come to bring you our thoughts and our prayers and our confession. And as we come to this amazing king, let's do that at this moment. In this moment's quietness, let's bring to him the things that we need to say sorry for, things we've done and shouldn't have done, things we've said and shouldn't have said, and things we've failed to do and failed to say. Let's use this moment to confess. Lord, thank you that you hear us. You're always willing to forgive. You're a God who forgives. Make us people who are willing to forgive. So, Father, we draw near to you as your family. And as we do, let's use that family prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hostick is going to come and lead us in song, um, King of Kings forevermore.
sorry, my apologies. We got, got there very quickly. I didn't realize it was me straight away. I'm going to keep my mask on if that's okay, but I'll speak as clearly as I can. So let's just come to the Lord with our prayers of intercession. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you in prayer, that no matter where we are, whether we're in a place of worship or in our own homes or in our car, we can come to you in prayer. Thank you that you are a God who hears and that we can bring to you the things that are on our hearts and the things that concern us. We continue to pray for our country and the world as coronavirus continues to spread around us. Father, we pray with regards to our own country at the moment for the schools, children and teachers and classroom assistants for colleges. Lord, as students seek to get back to study, as children look to get back in, getting back to working together and playing together, as teachers try to implement new rules and ways of doing things, Father, we just pray that you will help all of those involved. For the children and the students, we pray that they would still be able to enjoy their studies enjoy meeting their friends, that they would um, get back to some semblance of normality. For the few schools we've already heard about, Lord, where there's been um, cases of coronavirus, we just pray for those students who maybe find themselves at home again. And we just ask that you'd help them and give them patience and help them cope. Father, we pray for those in our country who have been hit with financial insecurity because of coronavirus, Lord, as the weeks stretch on. And we just ask you, Father, that for each one of those people, you'd somehow come alongside, Lord, and give them reassurance and hope um, and help them just to feel some measure of stability in all of the uncertainty. We pray for our leaders national and local, government leaders, health leaders, God, the, our church leaders. We pray for Gary and Dawn. We thank you for their leadership and guidance to us. We thank you for their care of us. We pray that you would continue to encourage them. We thank you for the team of leaders that support them. And we just pray that you would continue to be their providers. Father, we continue to pray for any amongst us who are struggling with ill health, or family and friends that we're concerned about. And we just ask you, Father, to give us hope in those situations and to work your healing hand. Father, we also continue to remember those who still struggle with bereavements that have happened in the last number of months and where someone is missing a loved one. Father, we just pray that you will come and sustain them. From the well-known prayer that Paul prayed for the church in the first century. I've put it into my own words. Father, we pray that you will strengthen us with power in our inner selves, that Jesus himself will dwell in our hearts by faith, that each of us will be rooted in love, that we will be aware how deeply and broadly we are loved so that we can be filled with what Paul termed the fullness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading today is from Luke 22, verse 39. Um, Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted with sor from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And then he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have to come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you didn't lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for that little prayer, Sarah. So we're on a, we've been on a journey up all these mountains. I hope you've enjoyed it. I don't know if it was the nine peak challenge or the, the 10 peak challenge or the eight peak challenge. We've spent a couple of weeks up some of the challenges like Sinai and Mount Tabor. Wonder which of them made an impression on you the most. Great stories from all those mountains. Today is our last mountain. The final part of the challenge, the final part of the, the excursion before we come maybe back down into the valley. Maybe Terry is going to bring us to some of those Welsh valleys or Israeli valleys or wherever it might be. But today we're on Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives, which is eight, at its highest point. It's the number of peaks, but at its highest point is 818 meters tall. <clears throat> tall, but not that tall. I don't know if you've ever been there. Maybe you've been to the Holy Land. As I've, as I've been looking at these mountains and reading about them and, and, and exploring them just online, I think, gosh, it'd be great to be there, wouldn't it? And actually walk up those mountains. Well, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would be a bit, hmm. So that's the Mount of Olives behind us. Um, it's just east of the city of Jerusalem. There's the old city of Jerusalem, then there's the Kidron Valley, and then there's the the Mount of Olives, and if you keep going that way, you'll go towards Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, and Lazarus was raised from the dead. But this was a place that Jesus knew really well. Where that church is in the foreground is the place we're going to end up, because that is marking the garden at the base of the mountain, which we know as Gethsemane. But it was a through the years, it was a well-known place. Right back in 2 Samuel, we read about David, King David. And uh, we've looked at this before through some of the sands, but David's throne was under threat. His life was under threat from his own son, Absalom, and many of his comrades. And David vacated his throne in Jerusalem, um, went on the run for a while, and he went east through the Kidron Valley, and he went up the Mount of Olives that you see. In those days, it would have been completely covered with olive trees. That is why it was known as the Mount of Olives. Um, he went up the Mount of Olives weeping, King David weeping, walking up this hill, knowing that he had to go, but he would return. And then we find in Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, it's just this wonderful image of of God present in the temple. For we have, um, we have the temple mount, we have the old city of Jerusalem, and God presents himself in the Holy of Holies that we know, the place where God chose to dwell. Um, and that's where the Israelites came to worship, came to celebrate three times a year in those festivals, and once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. Of course, the whole universe could not hold God, but he chose in a special way to presence himself in this place 
for these people. But these people became so sinful, so wayward, and I'm sure we can identify with that personally. But Ezekiel has this image, this picture, this vision of God's presence leaving the temple and moving east and remaining at Mount Olivet. God was leaving the place, said, if you don't want to worship me in spirit and truth, what is the point of me staying? So this image that Ezekiel gives us of God leaving the temple, this is unheard of, leaving his city, Jerusalem, and staying over all of it. So all of that's had a, a long history, and then in the New Testament, it is named over and over and over again. It was, it was a, a route from Jerusalem to Bethany, as I said, and Jesus spent a lot of time on this mountain, a lot of time in this place, praying, taking his disciples. Um, and then a few of the key, a few of the key times on this, on this place is, well, Palm Sunday that we know really well, and that triumphal entry, Jesus came on the donkey down Mount Olivet towards Jerusalem. And as he came on that donkey, and there was great celebration, for it was Passover, and there are many people there. We know the story and the palm branches and so on. And there was this wonderful celebration. But as Jesus rounded the hill and as he caught a glimpse of Jerusalem, he didn't celebrate. He wept over Jerusalem. Why did he do that? This is what he says. If you, as he saw Jerusalem, this place that he loved, the holy city, the city of peace, Jerusalem, city of peace. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Never ends well whenever we reject God. Never ends well. And these people who had rejected him, and yeah, they were cheering as he came, but very soon, just a few days later, they would shout, crucify him. And Jesus knew that a day would come when Jerusalem would be flattened, and it was. Forty years later, the Romans came, destroyed the temple, completely flattened at Jerusalem. So Jesus wept over this city, this beautiful city, the city of peace that knew no peace. So Jesus wept as he came down all of it. And then during that Passover week, he would go to the temple and teach every day. And each evening he would go back up Mount Olivet to rest and come back the next day and go up Mount of Olives to rest until Passover night. And that's what we're kind of thinking about as we have communion he came, of course, and celebrated in the upper room with his disciples, the Passover, as all good Jews would. And this would be the last Passover that he would celebrate, the last supper with his friends, with his disciples. It must have been an agonizing experience for him because he knew what was to come. He knew he would offer his life. He knew that he would die for the sin of the world. And as they celebrated this meal that we will celebrate in just a moment, and after the meal, and Judas went out to betray him, and it was dark, John tells us, dark physically during the night, but also dark spiritually, as Judas went out to betray him. And after the meal, Jesus then takes his disciples to go and pray. And where does he go to? The place that he always went to, out to the Mount of Olives, but to the garden at the base of the Mount of Olives, known as Gethsemane. Jesus went out as usual, Luke tells us, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing... Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. I love this line. An angel from heaven, from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, this is the only place that word anguish, agony is used in the New Testament. He prayed more earnestly and he swept, 
The sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Of course, we know he went back and saw his disciples who were fast asleep. He says, waken up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. He went to this place that we know as Gethsemane. It's a word in Aramaic that means oil press. It was the place where the olives were brought and crushed to release the oil that blessed many. And it was here in this place that Jesus would be crushed, physically and spiritually crushed, so that he could be a blessing to many. He'd be squeezed. He would become the Passover lamb who would die for the sin of the world. The very first mountain that we climbed, I don't know if you remember, it was um, Ararat. We thought about Noah's ark, her rested on the mountain range of Ararat. And as the waters receded and Noah sent out a dove, you remember, he brought back a, an olive leaf. That was our first part of the journey, an olive leaf. And here we are on our last mountain, not one olive leaf, but a mountain of olive leaves and olives, a sign of hope, a sign of blessing, but a blessing that came at a price, the crushing of the Son of God, crushed so much that he sweat drops of blood, crushed so much that he was in agony, he wasn't in agony simply about dying. It was the kind of death that he would die. For he would be forsaken by his father. Forsaken. They'd never been apart, never been forsaken. From all eternity, the father and the son were together. But for this moment, because of your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world, he would be forsaken and become sin, as Paul tells us. Become sin for us. Not an amazing picture of love. And Jesus had talked about the cup. If it were possible to let this cup pass from me, this cup which represents God's wrath, and yet Jesus was to take it and drink it every drop because he loved you and loved me. He drank every drop. And that's what we come to celebrate today. That's what we're going to do. Sometimes, maybe it's good that we haven't celebrated communion for a long time because often familiarity can breed contempt and we just do things and we think about them but don't really think about them. We feel them but we don't really feel about it. But as we do it today, let's enter into the agony of what Jesus felt, the love that Jesus expressed, but ultimately the triumph that Jesus won. For we don't come to celebrate a king who has died, but a king who was raised, who ascended from the Mount of Olives and sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead when he returns to Olivet again. that's what we're going to do. We're going to remember that period of time 2,000 years ago when God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him, trusts in him, commits their lives to him, would not perish but would have everlasting life. Not just, as we said before, the length of that life but the quality that is eternal life. So we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. A statement of our faith, a kind of summary of all that the Apostles taught, written for us. And as we approach his table, we want to stand and say this is what we believe. So shall we stand? The words will be up here. Okay. I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So as we approach our God and his table, let's join together to pray. Let's pray. So Father, we come to you, our almighty God, our loving God, the one who created all things, the one who sustains all things, the one who has given us a way a way to be forgiven, a way to be reconciled, a way to be redeemed through the Redeemer, your Son, our Lord, Jesus, the Christ. Father, we have already confessed our sin, and we pray that you will continue to search our hearts and know us. Show us how we can better live for you, how to believe, how to follow, heart to love, heart to serve, heart to sacrifice. Father, we thank you that you're the amazing God who loves us. Thank you, Lord, that you know our weaknesses better than we know them, that you love us better than we know, that your plans for us are good. And Father, we pray that as we come to your table, that you will bless us as we remember and as we celebrate, Father, we pray that you will come close to us because we ask you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And so this is the table of the Lord. It is his table. He is the host. We are the guests. And the table is open to everyone who knows and loves him. And anyone can come to this table. You don't need to be a member of this church, but if you're a member of his church in the wider sense, you're free to come. If you have not placed your trust in him, don't feel under any pressure to come because that's not what it's all about. I'm going to read the words of institution that Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay. <clears throat> Seamlessly done. So we want to give thanks for this bread and for this wine. So should we do that? Let's pray for this. Father, we thank you for these common things, something to drink and something to eat. But for this moment, they are set apart for this special occasion as we remember you. So Father, we thank you that you give us these elements to remember a great and deep and wonderful truth 
that our God lives and reigns and loves us. Amen. So after supper, um, or rather he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Take it and eat it. And every time you do, remember. Remember me. Remember his sacrifice. Remember his love. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. There was an old covenant, but this is the new covenant in his blood. A new way, a living way. This cup is a new covenant in my blood and drink it, all of you. And when you do, remember that my blood was shed for the complete remission of all your sin. Isn't that amazing? So what we're going to do is it's going to be a little bit different from what we normally do. We do have the wine, which is non-alcoholic, in small glasses. And then we have the bread in little containers. And what I'd like you to do is come to the front and take one of each. Take a container of bread and take one of the wine and then return to your seat. I don't want you to eat it or drink it at that moment because we're going to eat and drink together if that's okay at the end. But if you'd come and you will be guided by our, uh, by our guiders, by our leaders, by Caroline and Alan. And we're going to do it one row at a time alternatively. So um, I suppose you guys should come first and then you'll be guided. One from this side, one from that side, one from this side, one from that side. And when you return to your seats, if you remember, if you allow the person on the inside to be seated first so they're not pushing past you. Just trying to do it as smoothly as possible and learning as we go. Does that make sense? But come forward, take one of each, return to your seats, and just don't eat it or drink it. Just wait, and we'll do that together. Thank you. And as we do, Jun Young's going to pray for us. Thanks, Jun Young.
Thank you, Jun Young. That was just really lovely. Thank you. You had to play for longer than you thought, but it was good to listen to. So, shall we eat the bread together? This is, um, yeah, you can take our masks off at this point. <laughs> and uh, and I can hear the pops of those little cases. This is great. So, this is the body of Christ. We remember that he gave his life to set us free. So, let's do that. And then we take the wine, reminding us of the blood that was shed at Calvary, a life that was offered, not stolen, but he gave it freely, the blood, the blood that atones for our sin. Let's drink together. Father, please let us never forget how much we are loved. Father, please never let us forget what you gave in order to set us free. Father, please never let us forget that when we put our trust in you, our names are indelibly written in your book of life that we become your family, children of a king, and brothers and sisters together. Father, help us to live in the light of this great truth, that Jesus died to set us free, that Jesus reigns and intercedes for those who love him and Jesus will return and so Father we remember until he does and we pray the prayer of John to come quickly Lord we long to be with you we long to see you face to face to be with you forever so, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to conclude our service um, as Jose again leads us in song, and it's When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
With the whole realm of nature mind, it would be an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine. It demands my soul, my life, everything. So as we leave, let's take those words with us. So should we pray as we finish? Father, thank you you've been with us today. Thank you for the privilege of being able to meet in a place like this, to remember an occasion like the one we have just remembered, and to celebrate a God who loves us, who lives, and a God who will return, a God who has all things in control, even though sometimes our world and our lives can feel out of control. But, Father, we pray that you'll pour your peace into our lives. And we'll take this good news, this message, to a needy world. Bring our light into the darkness. Father, help us to live for you. Not to keep it a secret, but to share it as you give us opportunity to do so. So, Father, we thank you for the people sitting around us. We all have our own stories our own fears, our own strengths, our own joys. We're all completely individual and yet one in you. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us today and forevermore.